Senator from Oregon. Madam President, I have already announced that I intend to support Judge Jackson's nomination. Her character and her qualifications are unassailable. But unfortunately, that hasn't stopped a number of Senate Republicans from treating her disgracefully. Too often, behavior in the hearings was simply shameful. And Madam President, it doesn't have to be this way, and it wasn't always this way. For example, even though I disagreed with him on plenty of issues, I voted for Chief Justice John Roberts, and he was treated very fairly by Democrats. Serious questions were asked and answered, and there wasn't anything resembling the over-the-line juvenile theatrics like that shown for Judge Jackson. Things changed when President Obama's final nomination was stolen by Republicans. They refused to even hold a hearing or consider the sitting president's nominee on just fabricated grounds. Democrats are trying to maintain a sharp focus on legal questions and personal qualifications. Faced with sideshows and personal attacks, we stuck to issues. And what was particularly striking about those attacks, they were attacks against somebody that Senate Republicans had voted for unanimously when she was nominated to a lower level court. My view is the radicalization in the court and the nominations process is just poisonous to our democracy. But that was what was on display when Republicans attacked Judge Jackson. So I want to start setting the record straight on several of the key issues. First, Judge Jackson was scarce, uh, squarely within the sentencing norm for cases involving child sexual abuse material. She was smeared anyway as going soft on predators. It was a gross and baseless accusation, more of a dog whistle to conspiracy, conspiracists than an attempt at honestly vetting a nominee. Even the National Review, nobody's idea of a liberal publication, published a column that called the comments of our sick colleague from Missouri, Senator Hawley, they called his attack meritless to the point of demagoguery. Those are the words of the National Review. The fact is, on this hugely important issue, the whole question of kids' safety. As the President of the Senate knows, there's a big difference between talking about protecting child victims and actually doing the work. Far too many of our Republican colleagues just come down on the wrong side of the divide. It is absolutely right that government at every level has failed to protect kids from exploitation online. Failure, failure's got a lot of causes. One is that the Justice Department, for reasons that I just find confounding, has consistently declined to put enough manpower and funding behind protecting these vulnerable kids. Another reason is that members of Congress talk a really big game, but when there's serious legislation to protect vulnerable kids, they disappear. Now, I've proposed an alternative. It's the Invest in Child Safety Act. It puts serious funds into tracking down the child predators and prosecuting these god-awful monsters and protecting the kids they target and abuse. It creates a new executive position to be confirmed by the Senate 
to raise this level of protecting kids and strengthening oversight. Now, instead of supporting that legislation, where we put, Madam President, real prosecutors and real investigators to the task of protecting our kids, putting more law enforcement on the beat, a number of Senate Republicans spend their days going after Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. So yet again, vulnerable kids are being used as pawns by politicians to advance their agenda. I simply believe child abuse and exploitation is too serious an issue for U.S. Senators to cheapen it with baseless accusations and ill-conceived legislation. This is the last subject protecting our kids that elected officials ought to be playing politics with. I'm going to use the remainder of my time, Madam President, to discuss another issue that came up often in the debate, and that's the right of American women to control their bodies. I'm talking here about Roe versus Wade. The Supreme Court has effectively overturned Roe already when you look, for example, at the various states. The courts overturned Roe for millions and millions of people. They did it on the shadow docket by allowing an obviously unconstitutional bounty law in Texas to go into effect. Now states all over the country are passing similar laws. In some states, they're going even further to restrict the fundamental right of women to control their own bodies. The fact of the matter is, this debate is not about Roe. It's becoming commonplace for Republicans to say out in the open that the Supreme Court ruled incorrectly in Griswold versus Connecticut, the 1965 case that affirmed the right of married people to use contraception. That's what this debate has become all about, not the right to a safe and legal abortion. It's about rolling back, Madam President, the right to birth control. Republicans are saying that the case that affirmed the right to use birth control was wrongly decided. That's what our colleague from Tennessee, who just spoke, said about the hearings on Judge Jackson's nomination. It's enough to leave you wondering, Madam President, what year is this? What century is this? Connecticut's ban on contraception was based on a federal law from the 1870s, a law from a time, a time when women's rights were few. They couldn't even vote. For Connecticut to have that kind of law in the books in 1965 was a ridiculous infringement on the liberty and body autonomy of American women. Estelle Griswold, the woman's right activist who put, whose name is atop the case, once half joked that the state would have to put a gynecological table at the Greenwich toll station to prevent women from going to New York to get the contraception they needed. But the history in Connecticut shows, as is often the case, this old restriction on personal liberty fell hardest on women without means, even when the law was badly out of date. The Supreme Court ruled correctly when it struck down Connecticut's law in 65. To say otherwise is appalling and alarming. The court recognized that the government ought to stay out of people's private decisions about family planning. A few years later, the court correctly applied the Griswold precedent to single women. The year after that came Roe. These cases are linked. Put together the attacks on Roe and now Griswold, they're about letting the government control when somebody decides to start a family. We're talking about rolling back 80 years of basic human rights. Prior to her appointment on the Supreme Court, Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote in these debates over Roe, I'll quote, also in the balance is a woman's autonomous charge of her life's full course, her ability to stand in relation to man, society, and the state, 
as an independent, self-sustaining, equal citizen. When the court upheld Roe in 1992, the majority ruled, and I quote, the ability of women to participate equally in the economic and social life of the nation has been facilitated by their ability to control their re reproductive lives. If women can't legally obtain birth control and they can't legally obtain abortion care, they no longer have legal control over their bodies. Let's be clear who does. The government has that control. If women do not control their own bodies, they don't control their own lives. If Americans don't control their own lives, they're not free and equal under the law. Tossing out Roe the way this court has is an act of judicial radicalism. Every Republican Supreme Court nominee swears up and down that they respect precedent, they won't legislate from the bench. Then they go out and toss out Roe on the shadow docket. For Republicans now to be going after Griswold is staggering and dangerous. For senators to be attacking this ruling 57 years after the case was decided is ridiculous. It's not just because the government ought to stay out of the exam room and the bedroom. It's not just because birth control is part of basic health regimens. It's because women in America have an equal right to chart the course of their lives and when to become pregnant. Now, Republicans often talk about their position in the context of states' rights. Too often, what they're saying is they believe in states' rights only if they believe the state is right. And we see that on issue after uh, issue. And finally, it's important to consider these debates in the context of what's happening in state houses around the country. Republican legislators are effectively banning abortion. They're passing laws that do more to protect rapists than rape victims. They criminalize abortion care. And in other cases, they're criminalizing the act of helping women obtain the health care they need. Some states want to make it impossible to use those kinds of uh, medicines and therapies to safely end pregnancies early. Republican lawmaker in Missouri re recently proposed forcing women to carry ectopic pregnancies to term which is effectively a death sentence. The bottom line is what's happening today in 2022 is collectively the most extreme attack on reproductive health, freedom, and equality in America I can remember. And I'm just going to close by saying this is not the same debate as we've had over Roe. State-level Republicans are going way beyond that point. For Republicans here in this Congress to be going after Griswold, after birth control, is a shocking escalation in the fight they're making to roll back the rights of women. American lives and liberty are at stake. Americans need to be prepared to fight for freedom and equality in the months and years ahead. I'm sure going to be out there with them. In the meantime, I believe Justice Jackson is going to make an outstanding Supreme Court justice, a bulwark for the rights of women and all Americans. This is a historic confirmation, one that is long overdue. I'm proud to give Judge Jackson my vote, and I urge my colleagues to support her nomination as well, and I yield the floor.